students hailing from the rural areas too. On the other hand, mission pioneers for eminence in imparting knowledge with a human face and creating an amicable atmosphere where students, teachers and the organization can grow together in synchronization for their mutual benefit. With the larger picture of an educated and well-meaning society belonging to all sections in the backroom. Implanting the seeds of discipline and professionalism among the faculty and students, incorporate the knowledge of education and research deep into the inimpressive minds of students, making our students the motto of job creators, not job seekers. Now it's time to introduce our beloved principal sir, who is the captain of Faculty of Pharmacy, a great team leader and affordable human being, Dr. Ed Hari Krishna. May I request our principal sir to address the participants for the Faculty Development Program. to welcome you all to the online faculty development program and the team, friends and advances in functional sciences. So because of COVID-19, our lives have been changed and all are going to stay indoors. Universities and educational institutions are trying to make this area their knowledge regarding fashion. The faculty of pharmacy, Dr. MGR Educational Research Institute, in continuation with its public awareness activities and successful webinar series in now organizing this online FTP for policy teachers with the relevant speakers and experts from national and international organizations. At this moment, I would like to extend my heartfelt gratitude to our founder chancellor, Dr. J.C. Chandra and Honorable President, Dr. J.C. J.C. Sarindumar, sir, and our Honorable Secretary to A.R. Kumar sir, under which would benevolence of all our efforts are taking shape. I am also welcome and thank Professor Dr. Desita Rakhina, respected Vice Chancellor, for joining us in this inaugural session. I also welcome our renewed speakers, Dr. Mohana, the Dean, UCS, SA University, Malaysia, and Dr. S. Kavari for joining us at this announcing moment. I also welcome all the participants to the first day, first day of uh, the TV program. I wish everyone a great learning experience. So thank you very much. Thank you for joining on the online TV program. Thank you very much. Very good morning. I am indeed very much delighted and privileged to introduce our most respected Vice Chancellor, Professor Dr. S. Gita Rashmi. Professor Dr. S. Gita Rashmi received a degree from Stanley Medical College in 1979 and a MD in Microbiology from Madras Medical College in 1985. She was awarded PhD for her research on allergic bronchopulmonary acetylosis in the year 2007 by the Governor of Dr. India Medical University. During her long career, she had held various teaching positions at at uh, Madras Medical College, Stanley Medical College, and Kilpark Medical College. She has been the Dean of Government Thirunamalai Medical College, Kilpark Medical College, and Stanley Medical College also. Professor Dr. S. Gita Rashmi has been the Director of Medical Education from 2014 to 2015. She served as the Vice Chancellor of the prestigious the Commonwealth of India Medical University in 2015. Dr. Gita Rashmi has also held the post of Vice President of the Chennai Chapter of the Tamil Government Doctors Association. Dr. Gita Rashmi has numerous memberships and fellowships, which is a very long list to read out at this moment. But uh, to name a few, uh, she is a fellow of Indian Academy of Tropical Parasitology. She is a scientific member, Selection Committee, Tamil Nadu Public Service Commission. She is
She is the chairman of the screening committee of Anna University Chennai. She is the chairman of the Organ Transplantation Authorization Committee. And uh, the list goes on. Uh, she has won a number of awards and awards in her uh, long career. She has conferred with the Dr. B.C. Roy National Award for the year 2016 in recognition of her outstanding service in the field of social medical relief. She is awarded the Best Teacher Award in 2011 and 2014 by the Tamil Nadu of India Medical University and Tamil Nadu Medical Council. Uh, she was the Best Administrator Award in 2012 by the Tamil Nadu of India Medical University. She won the Best Administrator Award by Blood Bank Association of India. She is honored with the she is awarded uh, she is by the Teacher Award in 2011 and 2014 by the Tamil Nadu of India Medical University and Tamil Nadu. Uh, she is uh, uh, awarded the Best Administrator Award from the Indian Association of Tamil Nadu of Microbiological University. She won the Best Administrator Award by the Tamil Nadu Association of India. So she is honored by the privilege. She is awarded by the Teacher Award from the Ministry of Health and Tamil Nadu and Tamil Nadu of India. She is honored by the Teacher Award from the Ministry of Health and Tamil Nadu. She is honored by the Teacher Award from the Ministry of Health and Tamil Nadu. She is honored by the Teacher Award from the Ministry of Health and Tamil Nadu. She is honored by the Teacher Award from the Ministry of Health and Tamil Nadu. She is honored by the Teacher Award from the Ministry of Health and Tamil Nadu. She is honored by the Teacher Award from the Ministry of Health and Tamil Nadu. She is honored by the Teacher Award from the Ministry of Health and Tamil Nadu. She is honored by the Teacher Award from the Ministry of Health and Tamil Nadu. She is honored by the Teacher Award from the Ministry of Health and Tamil Nadu. She is honored by the Teacher Award from the Ministry of Health and Tamil Nadu. She is honored by the Teacher Award from the Ministry of Health and Tamil Nadu. She is honored by the Teacher Award from the Ministry of Health and Tamil Nadu. She is Institute uh, deemed university uh, in Chennai, uh, one of the best universities uh, uh, in Chennai. Actually, it is within the city limit, and I should thank uh, our uh, chairman, uh, Mr. Yeshi Shanmugam, uh, Mr. Arun Kumar, President, and uh, Mr. Ravi Kumar, the secretary of the medical college and the paramedical courses, who had been made as possible to do this program free, I mean, with freedom. So as you know, like uh, we have been going through a lot of, uh, 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 well, we've been in indoors for a long time and still we would be there in indoors for another two or three months uh, because of the uh, COVID-19, uh, which has been uh, affecting us in, uh, from the month of January. So I would think that uh, during this uh, pandemic which we are undergoing, we have to learn a lot of lessons. Why it had happened and what should we do in future? So the lessons learned is how to deal with these kind of infections, the challenges which we face particularly in the pharmaceutical industry because it's not only COVID-19, it is other infections which we are going to see in the near future. So let us prepare ourselves for the future, particularly the pharmaceutical industry and the students, the young students and the young faculty who are in the pharmacy in pharmaceutical uh, departments or the industry have to work on research wing and also make in India as their motto and start their own entrepreneurship with, the, with, those, with their own available resources and as you know the MHRD the UGC and the AICT, they all have come together to provide you all a green channel where you can apply a lot of, I mean, you have to apply your prototype of your research and definitely you will be grounded, which you have mentioned in your research project. And this would lead you to Go further ahead, like the happiness which you find in 
finding out something new in your pharmaceutical industry so that this would later on would become a treatment schedule for the infection as well as for prevention as you know this uh, this institute dr mgr education research institute team university had been doing with uh, mr hari krishnan a lot of research and publication and we also have an intention of starting a small scale industry within our own campus so as a part of these activities and to upgrade in the whatever subject you are going to this the faculty of pharmacy has organized the online faculty development program on the three trends and advancement in pharmaceutical sciences the most recent the three decades of the indian pharmaceutical industry has changed into a global leader right now while india ranks the 10th globally in terms of its value it is ranked third in volume see value and volume so the production is more in india so various reports suggest that the industry has been growing at 13 to 14% over the last 5 years with an annual revenue of 38 billion us dollars a sharp rise Nine percent to the compounded annual growth rate of two thousand from between two thousand and two thousand five. India supplies affordable and low cost generic drugs throughout the world and operates more than two hundred and fifty US FDA and UK MHRA approved plants. No wonder that the Indian pharma industry is one of the driving forces of Indian economy. The COVID-19 situation has exhibited the dominant stature of Indian pharmaceutical industry right now, which has now been a global supply chain. So, drugs like paracetamol, hydroxychloroquine, and anti-cancer drugs are massively exported to some of the COVID-19. affected nations so there is therefore a much greater potential for india's pharmaceutical sector right now to increase trade partners both regionally and in other parts of the world the growth of pharma industry shall be exponential in the near future and as i know that when i was in us for some time most of the drugs were exported from india to utilize this opportunity we need to prepare a skillful workforce that would fulfill the needs of dynamic pharma industry as academicians we are all responsible to supply such task force by absorbing the changing trends in healthcare sectors so i congratulate hari krishnan principal faculty of pharmacy and the team for organizing such a nice event and i strongly believe every one of you will have the great learning experience in the next four days so let us all hope that the world will soon get back to its normalcy and till then stay home stay safe thank you one and all thank you for Thank you, ma'am. Thank you very much. Thank you, ma'am, for your valuable and informative keynote address. So let's begin with the first session. Today, all have joined on one platform to acquire the knowledge. Let's begin the technical session one by introducing our speaker on the core topic: transformational virtual learning. Now, I call. upon dr c n hemlata ma'am to introduce our speaker dr mohana dean faculty of pharmaceutical sciences ucsi university malaysia
a very good morning to one and all. Dr. Mohana Sundari Rajagopal, Dean Associate Professor, is a recognized expert in the field pharmaceutical sciences, focusing on pharmacology, phytopharmacognosy, community pharmacy practice, and pharmacy laws of Malaysia. She has been involved in the field of pharmacy practice for close to two decades after graduating with B-Pharmacy from University of Malaya, Malaysia. A particular passion is in natural product drug discovery, which encompasses pharmacology and phytochemistry. She is also much involved in the ethical pharmacy practice and community pharmacy practice. Dr. Mohana has contributed extensively in training numerous pharmacists in ethical practices. Her students have one of the highest patient rate of more than 98% in the Malaysian pharmacy forensic law examinations. Dr. Mohana obtained her PhD from the University of Nottingham, MC. She is also involved in active research collaborations with the University of Nottingham and University of Malaya focusing on research of antimicrobial resistance with anti-inflammatory mechanisms involving medicinal plants. She has been the guest speaker for international workshop on drug development and various Malaysian forums discussing the impacts of pharmacy in global healthcare. She was an invited speaker at the International Conference on Global Scenario in Pharmaceutical, Industrial and Academic Research during May 2018 at Dr. ABJ Abdul Kalam University, Indoor, India. She was also a panel guest in the prestigious HVO Wise Documentary on Antibiotic Research from Tropical Plants aired in 2015. She is actively involved in the faculty for the Strategic Planning, Pharmacy Board Academic Standards, Malaysian Qualification Agency Accreditations, and program standards amongst others. She is also in the board of directors at the ASEAN Society of Pharmacognosy and also a member of the Malaysian Pharmaceutical Society. Dr. Mohana has also been the counselor for public health campaigns by the faculty for the past four years, which focuses on public awareness on pharmacotherapy and disease and drug correlations. She is currently the dean in the faculty of pharmaceutical sciences, UCSA University, Malaysia, which is the nation's number one private university by QS, world ranking 481 in the world during the year 2019, and top 70 for the university under 50 by QS ranking. Thank you, ma'am. Now I request all the participants to mute your mic in the presentation of today's speaker. Now I hand over the session to the today's speaker of the technical session one, Dr. Mohana SRA, Dean, Faculty of Pharmaceutical Sciences. I welcome you, ma'am. Right. Um, thank you, uh, Dr. Hema. Um, I would like to say a warm good morning to um, the management of uh, uh, Dr. MGR University and I would like to say uh, thank you to the Vice Chancellor, Professor Gita, and Dr. Hari for inviting me today. So um, uh, it was a last minute invitation and um, uh, between the choice of research sharing and um, uh, academic uh, uh, status during this COVID-19 uh, pandemic, I think Dr. Hari preferred the latter. And I would like to share uh, what we have been doing uh, in the faculty and also in Malaysia in terms of the transformation from our conventional uh, uh, learning to what is um, uh, happening uh, during this pandemic crisis. So I hope everyone can see these slides. Right. So moving on, uh, a, little, a little introduction about where I am from. So UCSI University um, uh, is uh, ranked 391 in the World QS ranking 2021. I think the latest results just came out today. So we are the uh, one of the nation's uh, top private university, and uh, we this is our uh, campus, and uh, we um, allocated uh, between uh, four states in Malaysia. Uh, I am located in the headquarters, that is Kuala Lumpur, as you can see on the map, right? So we have uh, four campuses as I mentioned, with seven faculties, over 100 programs, and more than 10,000 learners from over 80 countries. So as for the faculty, where I'm from, we have been established since the year 2000, and we run um, five programs. 
sharing of uh, probably it will be beneficial for all academicians, uh, especially since the new norm is here and uh, what we have seen and what we have practiced over many, many years will never be the same again after this, henceforth. So um, for education, for most of us who have been academician, the teaching methods that we've been using have been uh, quite consistent over the past 40 years or more of what we can say is a cookie cutter one design fits all types of students and um, of course um, this is something that we need to look at at this present time because i will share later how um, learners our students are varying in uh, uh, ability and the way they study the way they learn everything is different and things cannot be the same as how it was when i used to be a student or when our parents used to be students things are changing and what will happen if we do not evolve uh, with this uh, technology and uh, the way the entire world is going uh, global with technology, especially with Industrial uh, Revolution 4.0. So the internet, as we know, has brought um, a transformation in many aspects of our lives. It is one of the biggest contributors in making the world into a global network. And one of the impact as we've seen after COVID, is especially so in education, I mean, most of us, when we look at most universities, either we are running on conventional mode of teaching and learning, or we have a blended mode that we call it. Uh, an inclusion of uh, technology into conventional classroom is what we call as blended uh, teaching and learning. But COVID-19, of course, has seen a lot of transformation. Uh, I will share with you what we have been doing. Before I move on to what we are doing, a little bit of recap on what is the difference between uh, online learning, virtual learning, e-learning, uh, distance learning, blended learning. I mean, there's too many jargons over there. Are they the same? Some people may use it the same way or are they the same? So learning um, uh, online is a uh, vast landscape. Uh, it, it, if asked, most of us would describe learning online in one specific way, which is learning on a computer. But learning online is much more nuanced and includes a spectrum of characteristic as we see it. The term online learning, virtual learning, e-learning, uh, and so on and so forth, each refers to the act of using technology in learning, but how students engage in that process is slightly different. For, for example, if we look here in this um, simple diagram here, online learning, uh, if we look at it, it's in the middle, it involves an internet connection and can include virtual face-to-face -face interaction. For example, what we're doing now, we've been an online lecture or virtual meetings. Uh, it also uses online tools like um, online curriculum, or we may even have virtual space or conferencing software. And when we look at virtual learning, it is actually an instruction that is delivered through the internet software or both, all right? It can be used inside or outside of a physical building of the educational organization. And we use a computer with an online program or software to enhance the learning experience. Uh, it can also be, the unique feature is that it is it can be used in a self-pacing format or individualized format for different types of students, all right? When we look at e-learning, e-learning basically is the utilization of digital tools for teaching and learning. And this technology facilitates the learning process and this can be used in the online setting or in the face-to-face -face classroom or physical classroom setting. So e-learning are just the tools uh, where else virtual learning is actually um, completely uh, where we go uh, out of the classroom setting. And on a blended learning, on the other hand, it's a combination of classroom and virtual learning. So it ideally integrates virtual learning in a way that individualizes and enhances the instruction to students, right? Now, moving on. So that's a recap about what this different jargons are in, in, in different types of uh, teaching platforms. So when we look at uh, UCSI University, our teaching technology existing um, before COVID-19 
we already had two forms of teaching technology for all students. One is um, on the left, you can see is integrated information system, or we call it the IIS platform. And on the right, we can say we can see learning management system or the LMS uh, platform. So the IIS platform is where the academic staff or the lecturers mark inputs, uh, 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 perform their student attendance, um, uh, key in their student academic performance, assessment performance, and so on and so forth. On the other hand, the LMS is a platform solely for teaching, uh, where uh, lecturers upload teaching materials, um, and also lecture notes, they conduct tutorials. So in the LMS platform is where the lecturers get a chance to, um, it is similar to a Facebook account, except that it is a, a platform uh, in the university open to all students. Uh, customized to a particular course module that includes the students who are still, who have who are in that particular classroom. So um, a lot of video uh, simulation classroom modes are there in the LMS platform. So this is what we have been using uh, uh, as a norm. Now our assessment methods for program include all of those that you can see. I, I mean we have every. Uh, university would have this, especially in pharmacy, you have your final exams, which is the um, uh, summative assessment, and you have various uh, formative assessments, we call it in education, like VIVAR, assignments, seminars, case studies, and even practical reports. So when in March 16, the um, uh, mini Prime Minister announced that uh, the nation, uh, Malaysia, is going to will undergo a lockdown or a movement constricted order uh, on March 18. So that gave us less than a day or slightly more than a day, I would say, to prepare on what we need to do. So it was a very chronic um, uh, uh, stage whereby we needed to strategize on the next course of action to ensure that our teaching and learning is not disrupted. At the same time, to think of what we can do for the students that they are learning outcome is achieved as the best that we can do. So um, uh, the good thing about our staff is that they are already equipped with uh, using blended teaching that means integration technology or various um, uh, e-learning tools in their, uh, their, uh, their teaching. So what we needed to do now is when individual lecturers with various e-learning tools could be different um, in this crisis situation because a crisis situation uh, being an accredited uh, university by the ministry, um, we needed to ensure that the quality is maintained in the staff teaching. So what we needed to do is to ensure we give all our lecturers training to ensure that virtual learning, different platforms so they synchronize so to follow the same procedure rather than uh, not <laughs> So we also needed to ensure that training students are on e tools so that they are Hello? Okay, so I'm going on. So training for students on e-learning tools, so we ensure that uh, So we've opened Malaysia, for example, in our university, are have an extensive uh, Bible that we Skype, uh, uh, Zoom, and also Microsoft Teams. So these were the three platforms that were used by the lecturers and the students to have synchronization in education. So of course, in a pandemic situation, students get worried and get worried what is going to happen to my children's education. For communication. So we needed to ensure there is transparent triage communication, which means uh, transparent communication between the faculty, between the students, to the students, and to the parents and who are part of the community. So this three-way communication was done almost on a frequent basis whenever there is updated ministry circulars 
so that the students and parents are aware on what's going on in the education line. So these are the various virtual learning platforms that were accessible to the students and the faculty members. Some of the uh, learning tools uh, were available through the uh, uh, student uh, registration. For example, Microsoft Teams and Zoom was also available to the students. Um, now, if we look at uh, this slide here, this was how uh, the teaching uh, was done um, using the uh, e-learning tools in a virtual learning classroom. So there were two types of classes that were conducted. On the left, as you can see, is we use what we call, um, uh, we have a broadcast center where you, um, the uh, particular lecturer can broadcast the uh, PowerPoint or whatever that slides that has been prepared uh, onto the screen and the students can actually view the screen as what we can see on the top, top left hand corner. At the same time to not lose the human touch of looking at the lecturer, they can actually view the lecturer speaking at the same time as you can see on the bottom uh, right hand corner. So on the right, uh, right hand side you can see live video conferencing held in a media room as well, connected to various um, speakers, webcam, and also a, a, a whiteboard. So it can be done, this can be done, of course, in a pre-recorded form or a live conference. And of course, during COVID, when everybody is staying at home, including the lecturers, it had to be done uh, uh, in a live uh, uh, form and not pre-recorded because all the we only had about one and a half days to prepare before we all had to stay at home. Now, this is another um, um, uh, technology that was that is available in our broadcast center. Light board, as you can see on the top, where the students can see the light board and the whiteboard lecturing so that even though that we are doing online, um, the lecturers can still use the whiteboard lecturing method, all right? Now, um, if we look at the question of how the faculty transform the teaching method from blended teaching to online teaching, or we can call it from conventional to online teaching. Uh, for some of the university, like for ours, it's from blended teaching to online teaching. We had a ridiculously short window in which we had to prepare our staff. However, our staff and um, uh, actually forged ahead with much grace, I must say. So we had a, a short period, as I was uh, saying, to conduct um, various online uh, uh, training for the staff and students. Uh, we needed to prepare uh, SOPs, how to handle online classes, because uh, no matter what, even if we are working from home and the students are studying from home, we needed to ensure that the quality of education does not get compromised. Because being a, um, a professional, uh, the Bachelor of Pharmacy Honours is governed under the Pharmacy Board of Malaysia, a professional body, and we needed to adhere to all the quality that uh, was required from the education. So various SOPs, as I mentioned, on how to conduct online classes, how to conduct online examination. So the online examination, I will share how we did this um, while staying at home. So we had to convert even... Um, the challenge was on the practical classes and attachment. So our students experience industry attachments, community attachments, and hospital attachment throughout their four year of uh, BPharm education. So we had to convert now even this practical and clinical classes online. Uh, and this required innovation in how we use various uh, video or pre-recording or uh, e-learning tool uh, using various software for example, whiteboard for calculation-based uh, studies, chemistry classes, uh, simulation for pharmacological classes, and clinical classes with mock uh, and also role-play uh, simulation. So there was a lot of um, uh, innovation that was demanded out of faculty members. And uh, I would say this, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic did see this um, creativity being uh, uh, displayed by the faculty members. So we were also exploring uh, various online pedagogies um, uh, that uh, ensured that we had real-time connection with the students. All right. Uh, so we will do all of this uh, by sure that we have empathy and flexibility for the students because everyone is in much anxiety at this period of time in this crisis. So all this conversion was done uh, 
is empathy so that no one gets um, uh, shocked by this transformation. Right? So now, when we look at student feedback on tough practice, there are many reasons why um, uh, online programs, uh, teaching has become popular. All right. However, uh, of course, in anything positive, there comes some negative, and the negative is when we take the room for improvement of what we can see. So, if we look at the students' feedback, um, the flexible and accessible part was where the students felt that they can participate in high learning, uh, high quality learning situations. Um, where, uh, where they cannot be in face to face classes. The students can participate in classes from anywhere, wherever they are, be it they are in the hostel or back home, because they were not allowed to move from one state to another. And then, uh, in addition, this online format so allowed um, physically challenged students uh, more freedom to participate in classes because of the equity that is uh, seen within all students. All right. So, on the other part, uh, the students felt they can have this class anytime, any pace. Um, time efficiency is what students felt is very much possible for them. All right, when they continuously look at notes and the they wanted. So online method of education can be highly effective um, alternative to school and students. That you get. However, it may not be the same for all students, though. All right. So, uh, uh, when we look at cost effectiveness, all right, um, of course, like the online education offers a much more affordable uh, option because of, um, uh, they felt that they can save money, students can save money from commuting or class material, which is a full for online. online. So in, uh, in other words, monetary investment is less for the student, but the results can be better than other options. Now, when we look at the other part, is level playing field. This is a big important feedback that we received from the student, whereby students felt that when they are in online uh, education, there is a certain measure of anonymity, whereby um, uh, those who are introvert learners felt that it gave them a platform that, um, although they are shy and introvert, they felt that they had, uh, they felt that they were more able to communicate effectively to the lecturer on the other side because of the anonymity that is being displayed in online education. All right. Now, on the negative part, of course, there's there are limitations of uh, Access, especially for those students <coughs> rural, because all students went back to your hometown before MCO, the um, movement control order started. So those who are in the rural and lower socioeconomic neighborhoods <coughs> problem may have a problem of lack of access. All right. So uh, speaking from an administrative point of view, students cannot afford the technology uh, that the institution employs. Of course, they are lost as a potential customer, but if the participants' time is online, uh, online is limited, then of course the amount of um, outcome that they get from the education is also limited. All right. The other things that we've noticed is computer literacy. Not every student possess the um, um, IT savviness that we require. Some, very few, in fact, because of the generation. So there is very few possess a minimal level of computer knowledge. So we had to attend to that as well. So how did we deal with all of this is, of course, sometimes online uh, education, you can have breakdowns uh, occurring at any point of time. For example, the server that hosts the program can crash and cut all the participants from the class. Uh, individual students PC may have some problem that could limit their uh, involvement. So the faculty looked at this on a frequent basis, week to week basis. We had a, a platform for them to get their feedback and we actually started uh, various trainings and uh, for the students where the computer service department of the university came forth and was uh, available to the students for personalized counseling on how they can improve their uh, Wi-Fi or internet connection or even making do with the um, uh, physical uh, with the sorry with the limited technology that they have back home so uh, it was very uh, challenging but yet the students found that the faculty and the university had um, a piece of 
emotion displayed there, the human value was depicted, depicted there, and they felt that to be very customized and uh, 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 happiness index was present there. So, uh, on, so uh, the other uh, challenge that we face for student uh, online education is dependent learners. Now, a student must be well organized, motivated, uh, possess high degree of time management skill so that they can keep up with the course that is online. Now, for this reason, online education seems to be a challenge for those who are dependent learners um, who require uh, a lot of one-to-one uh, um, uh, um, uh, -one, uh, con uh, consulting uh, with the uh, tutors. So for this, what we did is um, we lecturers identified those dependent learners by getting their feedback. And there was one-to-one um, uh, -one or maybe two or three people in a particular classroom with more tutorials so that the lecturers can use uh, e-learning tools um, in a smaller classroom so that they can have their feedback. Because when we look at our online classrooms that we run, uh, one classroom, just like face-to-face, -face, can have all the students, up to 100 over students at one class. So by identifying this, we can actually determine uh, if we look at generally studies have been done, you can say 61% of college students found that technology helps them to engage with course materials. So education and uh, educators need to evolve themselves to be in line with this change. Now, more, one of the most uh, interesting challenge that we had was how do we conduct online examination? Because the uh, lockdown has been from March and up to the end of the semester. So there is no way that we can uh, conduct uh, physical uh, examination. And although we could postpone the examination, but chronic stage for those graduating student final year, because uh, we, not, we do not want uh, for them to have to delay their study. So we needed to explore ways to do this online. So this is where we came up with an online examination. So after various trainings and uh, uh, exploration with the computer uh, service departments. So we are uh, we decided to go uh, and do online examination. So now the big uh, the the most important thing in on, uh, in examination is of course students cheating. And the first thing that comes to your mind is if when it's done online back at home, for sure they can be using their books, textbooks in front of them, uh, people with them. Uh, so a, an actual examination becomes an open book examination, which we do not want because we want the, the examination to be conducted similar to face-to-face -face or as much or as close as possible. So what we needed to do is there has to be proctoring. So how do we do proctoring? So we came up, uh, we explored remote proctoring. Remote proctoring is where lecturers being at home can proctor the students at their home and we can do it uh, very close to how we do physical examination. In fact, I would say it's much more stringent than physical examination that happens with uh, hundreds of students in a big uh, hall. So how do we do this is, when we are doing the uh, proctoring, um, the uh, proctor or the lecturer can actually view the student's webcam and we can view the student's screen from their own laptop. So we do, this is what we call remote proctoring, all right, or control remote exam invigilation. So this is a simple procedure of how we do it. So the candidate sits at home or in a room undisturbed with no one in there. Uh, logs into an online exam using secured browser and this browser is what I mentioned earlier. Uh, students have an access to IIS system and CN system. So the CN system is only, uh, only the students have an access to the CN system with their password. So they log in there and the exam questions are available in that platform published at the start of examination by the lecturer. So before the examination begins, the proctor uh, identifies uh, the candidate verification remotely. And then, of course, uh, during the um, uh, uh, um, uh, time before examination, uh, there is a lot of detection, cheating detection that happens, whereby the student uh, needs to uh, move their laptops or the webcams around the room to say there's no one. They're not allowed to go to the toilet. And um, uh, to uh, the laptops are moved to ensure that there is no papers or documents and um, 
Handphones have to be placed within the view of the proctors, so the students do not have access to the handphones. All right, so all these multiple things are carried out according to the SOP we prepared during this uh, lockdown period. So during the then the examination is published and live streaming and recording is done for each individual student so that in an event that we the proctors detect something suspicious, they can go back to the recording uh, before the student is taken action by the student disciplinary board. So this is an example um, of how the webcam uh, of the student um, or that could be an external webcam or an embedded webcam within the laptop is being viewed and the proctor can view uh, the student's webcam and the proctor can also view what is on the student's uh, screen. All right. So here's an example of our own exam being conducted here. So on the top right hand corner, you can see the proctor at the bottom right hand corner and the student there. So um, it's a bit, uh, as you can see, the student's a bit uh, above because she's actually using her webcam to show the proctor that nobody is in the room. And on the left hand side, you can see that the proctor on the, uh, on the uh, bottom, we can see the student's webcam at the bottom and also we can see the student's screen. So we, we need to uh, be able to see the students so that we know nobody's around the students. We need to be able to see the uh, screen of the students so that we know that the student is not opening any other windows to have an access to Google so that they can check the answers to the question. Because whenever they click any other window apart from what we see here, the proctors will know. So this is how we did um, remote proctoring, right? Now, moving on, the big question is, is learning is virtual learning the future of education? All right, seeming, seeing that this uh, is what we have been practicing from COVID, and we have seen that uh, it has its positive sides and it does have its negative side, although not as much as the positive, but is this the only way forward for the future? Now, before we can understand that we have to learn, uh, we have to uh, understand the online learning spectrum over years. And if you look at the left hand side, it's the face to face um, classes that we all have been exposed to when we were younger, where 100% is a traditional brick and mortar classroom. Uh, no technology or very little technology is used to enhance learning. All right. And then you have this blended uh, learning that what we have been practicing all along is where a little bit of uh, technology is incorporated to deliver, facilitate uh, the classes, all right? And uh, in this blended learning, probably, uh, for an example, um, probably 70% or 75% of teaching is traditionally in the classroom, and maybe 25% or 30% is technology-based online uh, classrooms. Now, uh, what we saw during COVID is in the far right-hand corner, which is 100% online where entirely every instruction, interaction and activities take place online and there is no face-to-face -face, um, a classroom at all. Now, looking at, at this, um, we have realized that for courses like, such as pharmacy or medicine, um, there it, or any life science uh, for that matter, uh, even engineering, we have discovered, these are the courses, life sciences, medicine, pharmacy, engineering, it is impossible to go 100% online as what we've been doing for COVID. All right, it is, it is okay for the spirit of lockdown, but it's not conducive for the entire um, uh, education because the fact that uh, pharmacy, for example, needs to have some form of hands-on. For example, drug development, formulation, uh, aseptic preparation, preparation of drugs, all this, you need to view it firsthand in classroom in the lab. So these are the thing, and for example, uh, attachment in hospital is absolutely must because these are students who will be clinical pharmacists in the future having to deal with patients. So they need to have this face-to-face -face interaction. So uh, all these uh, programs that I've mentioned, we've discovered that we cannot go 100% online or 100% virtual learning as we call it on the right-hand side. But what we need to do now, we have to go is hybrid learning as you can see in the third box. So hybrid learning is where we merge online and face-to-face -face instruction, integrate them, all right, in a more balanced manner. If you look at blended learning, probably 70% traditional classroom, 30% is online. But in hybrid, it's nearly 50-50, where there is more incorporation of 
uh, uh, virtual learning in the education. So, and how do we handle hybrid learning? There are certain factors that need to be assessed uh, and balanced to determine if the approach fits best to the goals that we want. What do we want the students to achieve? So we need to check, uh, we need to balance the objectives uh, of the content learning. We need to ensure this balance in the students' intended outcome. We need to address student needs. We need to address students' access to technology. Like I mentioned, there will be minority of students in remote areas where they don't have. So in that case, how do we ensure that with minimal access to technology, this they have uh, 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 equitable access to, to education that they have uh, been registered for? And then we also need to ensure there's digital literacy, not only for students, but also our lecturers. So we need to incorporate all these factors to come up with a curriculum that embeds virtual learning as well as traditional classroom in a hybrid learning as what we call it. So why is why is all this fuss about online learning and hybrid learning is 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 on the is on the roll right now? Of course, COVID is the main reason why we are all talking about this. But on the other hand, um, COVID has given us has opened our eyes to say that um, it is time for us to change. Why we need to change is we have seen that our generation of students right now is very different from how we were, how I was, how my parents were during our time. Because if you can see on the screen, there are different types of generation. In 2020, we have four generations working side by side. You have the baby boomers, probably our uh, parents, then you have your generation X, uh, and then you have your generation Y, and you have our, uh, you can say your first year to students are what you call. All right, so generation Z. So the learning time, if you look at millennials, all right, on the screen, generation Y, these are students who are already being tech savvy, all right? And generation Z, as you can see, your children, they are really what we call digital natives. Or digitally fluent they are much better than in, in in technology compared to us at very young age so when students are very much off in that uh, form of flow if we do not if we keep education as how it was years ago traditionally it's not going to work because students will be bored in classroom students will not be able to capture according to their learning style so this is where pandemic has taught the higher education one thing it is changing, the disruption is inevitable, and we need to change. If we look at what is happening around us, the nature of work is changing. All right, COVID has changed a lot of uh, job opportunities, type of job, uh, on those who are uh, dependent on online is uh, striving, whereas those who are on the other side are having a lot of challenges. Automation is something a lot of people, industries will look into especially in this COVID-19, looking forward to future because they realize that uh, they don't want to be in a position where if there is another lockdown or God will forbid another uh, pandemic, they don't want to be in trouble of having bankruptcy. And what do they need to do to ensure that their business is flowing? So automation is there. Then you have increase of private participation. Uh, and you have constrained funding, public sector, um, especially in the global recession that is happening right now. A lot of funding challenges are there, productivity challenges are there. But one thing can be changed despite all of this, and that is education. And this is how we need to ensure that although there are various disruptions, we need to move in time, embrace the technology, embrace the future of education, and see how we can move forward because what has been happening in the future will never be the same again and the new norm is now here to stay all right so i hope that this sharing has given everyone a bit of insights of how we all can develop ourselves as academicians and um, hopefully this sharing session has been beneficial uh, with this i like to thank everyone thank you very much for listening Um, thank you, ma'am, for your valuable session.
We have a few questions raised over the chat box. Dr. Shubhraj Mantri has raised a question. Can you explain about e-lab, ma'am? He has raised a question regarding e-lab. All right. Um, e-lab... Uh, um E-lab is where we use, we don't really have an E-lab per se. What we have is lab, like I said, we have, um, we are moving on to hybrid education, whereby uh, we have uh, the traditional uh, labs that we have in inclusion with a lot of e-learning tools or that can be used in the lab. For example, simulation tools, all right, uh, that is very much beneficial for uh, pharmacological lessons, uh, physiology and certain uh, formulation studies as well. So these are the uh, simulation software packages that we use in just a lab that we have. So as I mentioned, we cannot go to the present either. It's not possible for uh, various programs that are teaching, especially pharmacy. So we need to somehow have an inclusion whereby some things that can be done can be done so that the, the main reason is because of the generation of students that we have. If students are um, uh, Gen Z, as we call it, are very much digital natives, we need to ensure that the way we train them in the lab needs to also adapt to this. Uh, not so, we cannot escape the fact that you need to be face to face with your lecturer in the lab doing something on hand. Hands on is very, very essential. But at the same time, there are aspects of practical laboratory that we can use simulation so that on top of what they experience in the lab they can go back home look at the simulations and understand better especially for slow learners they can go through it over and over and not on just a single practical session hope it answers the question thank you ma'am ma'am i have one more question what are the current trends in development of educational training program and projects Current trends in development of education training programs and projects. Okay, uh, it's the question is very, very, um, how do you say, uh, very um, uh, general. So if you look at development of uh, educational training programs, we have a lot. And um, I would say this pandemic has given us a second look into revising our educational projects and training programs. For example, if we were heading in one area, we now have to look at, uh, of in course, in 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 sorry, of course, hybrid learning. So hybrid learning is the major part of We have many task force in the university, uh, educational uh, post-COVID task force that looks at uh, change, change, academic um, and we also have research post-COVID. A lot of um, noise. Okay, we also have research post-COVID uh, task force, whereby, as I've, I've not uh, mentioned just now about uh, research because it was purely educational, because research, as we know, during pandemic, everything is on hold. Nothing is happening. And so researchers have to uh, think new ways of doing research or looking at new areas in doing research. And of course, social science plays an important role whereby in uh, uh, pharmacy and med uh, medicine, we see the need to include a lot of social uh, research, social science research into our own research, uh, incorporating multidisciplinary research, for example, uh, because the COVID uh, trend has see shown us that the humanistic aspect of research is very important. So these are the two trends that we're looking at. One is the or academic uh, projects that we have post-COVID, projects that we have post-COVID on top of other um, task force that we have, uh, of course, for this, uh, during this pandemic. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, thank you, Dr. Magna, uh, for accepting my invitation. So- and Thank you, Dr. Hari, very much. Me. Uh, thank you. Really, it is uh, very nice to have. It's a good informative session to all the uh, faculty members. So during the pandemic disease, so really we are learning a lot of uh, technology even during the pandemic disease. Yes. So yes. really, this is, this session is uh, hope all uh, it is very helpful to all the faculties. So thank you once again for accepting my invitation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hari. Thank you very much.
Dear participants, technical session two starts sharply at 11 a.m. Kindly stay tuned. Thank you. 